Catherine Bruni Vera, uh, Chief Market Strategist at her new firm, StoneX. Thanks for being with us, Catherine. Thanks so much, John. Happy to be here. And my uh, colleague over in Bloomberg Economics, the uh, economist Stuart Paul. Uh, Catherine, let, let me send it over to you for uh, uh, some implications here. So this is this is day one of a Fed meeting. We'll get a, a monetary policy announcement tomorrow. What uh, what do you suspect are the possible implications? Well, if of course, if we get an upside surprise, it would increase the chances of the Fed hikes um, in July. I think uh, June is is more likely than not going to be no hike, John. Um, just to see what the repercussions of the 500 basis points and hikes are uh, year, you know, up to this point. Uh, so I think the Fed is more likely than not going to remain on hold unless there's some massive surprise to the upside, which nor I nor I don't think uh, consensus economists are anticipating. Well, look, I think uh, service prices are important. We have that super core index, you know, X housing, X energy. Um, we see this rotation from consumers consuming goods to services that's that's first and foremost on the feds on the feds mind um, that's one thing two I think um, how much wage growth is impacting inflation that's an academic um, um, exercise that that a lot of economists have been actively debating um, but I think if we do get um, inflation moving lower and the unemployment sustainably lower and and unemployment remaining this strong, um, then I personally will be um, giving more credence to the soft landing camp. It's not my base case scenario, but I think that's one thing that the Fed will be will be actively looking for. And the third, I would say, um, would be inflation expectations, John. We saw the New York Fed um, um, Consumer Expectation Survey showing that one-year inflation expectations continue their significant downward trend, and that's a, that's a good thing. Um, that said, we saw the three and the five year inflation expectations a ticking higher. So certainly inflation expectations feed into what consumers do today. And that's another thing that, of course, the Fed pays close attention to. Absolutely. I think that's that's de facto what's going to happen. And I think now we have to look to the uh, to the June number to see if that comes uh, drastically lower. We do have to take into consideration, John and, and Stuart, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, how how much base effects come into play. Uh, we, we do know that, uh, that you know, we have the oil shock last year, that's rolling off. Um, and in June, we're probably going to get another deceleration in headline um, uh, inflation. Um, so I think we need to take, take base effects into context here. I'm also looking at uh, the real wage data. Um, I think that's that's important to to continue to look at, um, and as I said, I think that the the Nehru and and where where that is remains relevant, even though it's kind of faded out of um, uh, out of a lot of economists' purview. What is the risk of some of these volatile prices moving the wrong way on the Fed at this at this juncture? What do you think, uh, Catherine? So I mean, oil is extremely volatile, and I think that you make a very good point with regard to ex inflation expectations, because off the peak, I was just looking at the numbers yesterday, and off the peak, um, the price at the pump on average is down, what, 30% off of, off of the peak. So that's fantastic for, for the average person who, um, you know, this is the, the, mo the biggest flat tax there, flat tax there is. Um, so that's, that's beneficial to the consumer. Um, in every in every cohort uh, on the economic on the economic scale, so um, so I think that's that's definitely having an impact on inflation expectations and on consumer sentiment. We even saw small business um, sentiment come out today uh, slightly higher. So I think falling energy prices are are positive, especially from the perspective of consumer confidence. Um, and as I said earlier, John, I think it's uh, as we as we have this fading effect of you know russia's invasion of ukraine roll off um it's just going to continue this downward trend and in fact we see we see the markets are probably going to open positive here because of this because of this data because de facto inflation is moving in the right direction oil prices are moving in the right direction um, shelter is is taking a, a longer time to roll off but historically it does take um rents it's kind of one of the more sticky prices so it's going to take rents some time 
I mean, John, you and I are here in Miami. It's a different story than everywhere else where rents remain high and the housing market remains in, in boom, right? So, so I always tell people, you know, even though I live in Miami, we can't talk about this. This is a completely different animal than, than the national, the national um, uh, home price index. Um, but shelter costs still remain the biggest component of CPI um, and about a third of the overall index. So I think that's where we need to put a lot of our focus. And I'll just add one more thing, which is the labor market remains, and I always go back to the labor market because I think it remains relevant, John. The labor market remains exceedingly strong, exceedingly strong. And when we're talking about people that have jobs and are making more money, maybe it's not the equivalent to the increase in inflation, but it's getting there, um, then you can certainly continue to finance the, the, those housing costs. Something's got to give at some point because housing costs continue to move so dramatically higher, outpacing um, wage increases. Um, but I think these are the things that, that we need to be focused on. Um, Treasury yields are, are dropping at two years down five basis points. Um, I'm just looking at the data here. We see a shift in Fed, uh, Fed expectations. Um, just uh, with just three basis points, Bloomberg is reporting of, of hiking priced in for June and 20 basis points for July. Um, so I think a skip is, is in play um, and maybe a skip in July as well. Um, my contention, and I'll finish here, John, to not, to not go too long, but um, I do think the Fed is going to have to hike at least one more time. I think the terminal rent rate is probably 5.5%. Of course, this depends on the data, um, but my view is that with a labor market so hot like we have right now, habits of consumption do not change. If habits of consumption do not, do not change, consumption is unlikely to, to contract. So if that's the situation, I think inflation remains sticky for an extended period of time, requiring the Fed to move later down the line. So the next move, in my view, is unlikely to be a cut. It's more likely to be an additional hike. Jump in there. Okay. Can I follow up with 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 the um, with our PhD uh, on the panel? <laughs> um, I wonder if you think, Stuart, um, if that renders the Behringer curve less effective. I assume yes, you do think so, because if we if we're not if we don't find the data credible in itself, um, or at least not not exactly accurate, um, how much can we actually believe in? you know, job openings being above 10 million, growing in the last number rather than moving lower, you would expect job openings to drop before you get an uptick in the in the unemployment rate as intuitively, and this is how I like to tell our clients, intuitively, um, companies, both small, medium, large, take those jobs off the table, remove them from Indeed, remove them from Bloomberg Jobs, remove them from LinkedIn before they start um, uh, taking down their la their own labor force. So how much do you think the Behringer curve is no longer relevant? And and how much do you think Nehru is no longer relevant? The non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Even the Fed, I, I read a piece, um, forget which Fed it was, uh, an essay, saying basically that, that, that the that the Nehru is very hard to estimate. We know that. But it could be around 4.9%, 5%. You know, we're way below that. So I think we all agree that the, the current wage growth it is not commensurate with the 2% inflation target. What is? I mean, if you look at history, my analysis says it's about 3.5%. We're getting there. We're getting there. But do we need to get to 5% unemployment for the Fed to really actually sustain its or, or achieve its 2% inflation target? So there, there are two elements. There are two elements that we need to think about. The first is job openings. Which we, which we could take as realistic or not, the 10.1 million job openings. Uh, I don't think that it's especially realistic. Mm -hmm. I think the more important element, of course, is the unemployment rate, which could be influenced by two things, whether uh, firms start firing people, regardless of what they do on LinkedIn and, their, and other job opening sites, uh, and the desperation of workers uh, or folks who have been sitting on the sideline. If they decide to enter the labor force and it, it becomes very slow for finding jobs, uh, then again, we would see that uptick in the unemployment rate. And in fact, mm -hmm. during recession periods, we do continue to see an increase in it, the increase in the unemployment rate is split about 50 50 between workers being laid off and total employment declining and the labor force just continuing to tick up as workers look for sources of income that right. they can support. 
that they that could support their spending habits in a low growth environment. John, maybe I'll maybe I'll add that. I mean, the so core PCE is more than double the Fed's target. So the Fed doesn't want the biggest contributor to CPI to be returning to historical means. It would want it to be contributing negatively to get inflation from more than double its target to its target. Um, so so certainly I think what may be a, an unpopular opinion, I think the Fed the Fed needs to force the hand of a contraction in consumption, which is two thirds of the US economy to get inflation meaningfully to the 2% target if the Fed is serious about its 2% target. I mean, I was in New York last week, a lot of guys and gals are talking about um, the Fed changing its target um, to nominal growth, which could happen. I don't think it's gonna happen. I don't think it's going to happen before they meet their arbitrary 2% target, but that's their target. Yes, it's an average target, but it's still their target. So I think that the Fed has a credibility issue that it needs to tackle before changing prematurely its target. Um, the other thing I would add that we have not discussed at all in this, in this half an hour is the fiscal deficit. I mean, we're at full employment in the US economy and we're still running a 6% of GDP fiscal deficit. So we can, we can argue about the impact of profligate government spending on inflation, but that's there. And that's you know double where it was uh, pre-pandemic. Um, and I think it's really important to, to consider the implications both of fiscal policy on inflation, monetary policy on inflation, as well as these exogenous impacts and, and you know, it, it, such as oil prices and the invasion of Ukraine and, and, the, and the COVID impact on supply chains. All right. Well, uh, with that, uh, you, you know, for uh, our sort of closing remarks, I, I pulled up the uh, three month uh, annualized change on the on, on the core and lest anybody get too excited about a big, exactly. big change out of today's report. Uh, this is uh, basically a straight line. Uh, <laughs> exactly. A, sh a straight line that a kindergartner would, would draw, but a, a, a straight line. Uh, and so um, if anybody can can see an a trend in this this number, whether uh, improving or, or, or worsening, uh, I'd, I'd like to have a word with you. That looks like a, a line to me. Uh, so um, we will leave it right there. Uh, thank you very much to my guests, Catherine Rooney-Vera and Stuart Paul. And